Oh yeah, that's how you can do it. So first of all, let's begin by adjusting our motivation. And we do this by reciting the words for refuge, for Dichita, and then Gantang Lagema. It's very important for all of us to adjust our motivation because if you set up the motivation correctly at the beginning of the activity, then all the effort uh, that you make um, during the activity will actually bring about some meaningful and positive result. Otherwise, if you don't set up the motivation right, still you make all the effort, but actually the ben you know like the benefit that you get. Um, at the end is not there. So make sure you set up the motivation correctly. So we should know that uh, the Kadampa, the old Kadampa Lamas used to say there are two activities, so one at the beginning and one at the end. So the activity at the beginning refers to adjusting the motivation and the activity at the end is the dedication. You see, there is no actual mention of what comes between the motivation and the dedication, which is the actual act, the actual activity, right? This is not mentioned. And the reason for that is if you set up your motivation right, then it means that the actual activity that you carry out will come out well. It's taken care of. And once the activity is established well, in order not to waste any of the virtue that you have created, at the end, you do a dedication. So whatever is the appropriate dedication, whether it is for supreme enlightenment or anything, something similar to that, uh, make sure that whatever virtue we created didn't go to waste. So just be aware of this. There are two things, one at the beginning, one at the end. If these two things are right, the part in the middle is taken care of. Okay, so now from the sevenfold divisions of different types of awareness, we have completed the presentation of the first one, which is uh, direct perceivers. Today, we will begin with the second one, which is inferential cognizers. Really, inferential cognizers are not fully developed or presented in great detail here in um, away in the different types of awareness in the Loric text. If you really want to see it fully presented, you find it in the Tarig, which is science and reasoning. But since it is part of the list and appears here, Gesho says, I will make the effort to present it as best as possible. Hmm. Okay, actually, this, um, this category, the inferential cognizers or inference is extremely important to us. The reason for that is that we, when we ordinary beings realize different phenomena, we don't do that directly. And uh, therefore, we need to rely on inference. We need to rely on inference for everything that we come to realize. Okay. When we talk about realization, there can only be two types of realization. One is direct realization, and the other one is realization through inference. We don't have the direct realization, and therefore we heavily rely upon inference. And this is the reason why it's important to understand inference. Mm. All right, so the, if we want to look at the term in Tibetan, we translate it as inference in English, but in Tibetan, we have two syllables, two words uh, for this term. The term is je pak. Je means subsequent. So it means that it follows after something else. So what has come prior to that? What has come prior to that is the reason. And it shows you that inference must rely upon this reason. First, there is the reason. And due to this reason, you make an inference, isn't it? So the first syllable, the syllable or the first part of this term is subsequent, indicating subsequent to the reason that has come earlier. The second part, of uh, this word is in Tibetan is pak. And pak here means to understand. It means to realize. So it's a subsequent uh, understanding, subsequent realization. Okay. It's important to explain here how do you realize with inference? You don't realize it directly, you don't realize it clearly. 
but you realize whatever you realize, it, you realize it by having it mixed with a generic image. Okay, so inference is a subsequent realization where you realize things mixed with a generic image. So the actual term inference in Tibetan Jepak, we refer to it as Jepak, is uh, Jepak is sort of like the short, if you want, uh, consolidating the term, because this is a term that you can expand. And if you expand it, you will get a good understanding of what is happening here. So it's talking about a realization which is different from direct realization because it is a realization that you develop by relying upon uh, reason and logic. And that reason and logic must come earlier, must precede. So first comes the reason, the logic, and then by relying upon this, subsequent to that reasoning, you come to realize, but you realize it in a way that is different from the direct realization. So all of this together, uh, in English, we call it inference in Tibetan Jepak. Okay, so let's look at, at the um, Sanskrit word, the actual or the original Sanskrit term that in Tibetan is translated as jepak, as inference. The Sanskrit te term is anumana. So anumana, again, is two words. The first part is anu. Anu means earlier. Okay. Oh, sorry. Anu means later, right? Subsequent. Okay, so anu means subsequent. So just uh, it fits perfectly with the Tibetan je, which means subsequent, right? And then we have the mana in Sanskrit means realize. So if uh, the Tibetan Lodzawas, the great translators, were absolutely faithful to the Sanskrit, the term in Tibetan should have been Je tok. Uh, so exactly subsequent realization, but they didn't translate it as je tok. They translated it as je pak. So instead of using the actual word in Tibetan for realization, which is tok, they use the word pak, pakpa. Pakpa here means to measure, to ascertain, to come to understand is not exactly the same as the word to realize. Okay, so the reason why they made this choice in the translation be is because they wanted to show that, first of all, you have a reason, a logic, a logic, a reason, and you have a particular type of mind that needs to rely, needs to understand that reason, and having understood this reason, following that thing that happens there with the reason, then you understand the meaning. So it is a subsequent realization, but they didn't use the word realization. It was like a subsequent assessment, more or less, you would say. Yes, I says, I think that although they deviated from the actual Sanskrit, this term indicates how you have to go through the process of relying upon the reasoning. And therefore, it's very good because it shows you the mechanism. So subsequent assessment. Okay, so we say that what happens here when you have inference, you assess a, a situation uh, and you reach an assessment, a subsequent assessment, which happens by relying on the reason. So we're going to give you an example to illustrate this. Uh, we will not go very technical because you don't know the technical parts of the reasoning and the logic. So let's say in colloquial language, everyday language, um, up in the mountain where there is smoke, there is fire. Why? Why do I think that there is fire? Well, because I can see the smoke. All right. So you see, I have made an assessment that follows from the fact, from the reason, the fact that I can see the smoke up there. So I have a subsequent assessment, which is actually a subsequent realization that there is fire burning up there. 
Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, we have generated a my, an inference, and that inference here is the mind that realizes uh, that there is fire up in the mountain. It is very important for us here to uh, actually make sure that we are not just um, saying things like this. We're not just guessing that this, in other words, that this is a correct assessment. So for this inference, for this subsequent assessment to be correct, to reach the right conclusion, if you want, there's two things that must be in place. So the first thing is that it must be subsequent. So remember, it's a subsequent assessment. Subsequent means it is subsequent to reason. So there must be a reason. First of all, we must rely upon a reason. We're not just saying things. We rely upon the reason and we assess the situation. And what was the reason? We saw the smoke. We said there's smoke up there in the mountain, isn't it? So this is, first of all, is the reason. The reason is in place. And now based on this reason, subsequent to that reason, following from that reason, we assess, we measure the situation. And therefore, we reach the correct realization that there is fire up there. All right. So Geshe was saying, this is why I think the actual Tibetan term which is not subsequent realization, is subsequent assessment, actually has more flavor, more meaning than the original. <laughs> okay, so we talk about inference and we say that this uh, subsequent assessment uh, must rely on a reason. The reason is what comes first. So to make the correct assessment here, you can see because we rely on the reason, we must also examine whether this reasoning is correct or not, because there are different types of reasons. There are pseudo reasoning. They appear to be correct, but actually they're not really correct reasoning. Uh, there are different type of reasonings that are indeterminate. So they cannot give you definite uh, conclusions and things like that. There are all sorts of reasons, not every reason is a solid, full reason to support correct realization. Sometimes we have something that acts almost like half, like half a reason, you know, not a complete reason. So this is not going to, this is not considered a correct reasoning that will give you, you know, solid footing in order to have inference. So it, when we talk about inference, we need to examine the reason. We must understand the reason. What makes a correct reasoning? Now, correct reasoning is something that is discussed in Tariq, uh, you know, science and reasoning. So that's another area of study. It is uh, discussed there quite extensively. And I uh, have to say it's a little bit complicated. Uh, if uh, you want to uh, very briefly on page 73 of this book, you will find the three elements that must be present in order to have correct reasoning. And the three elements is the subject, the provision, and the reverse provision. If you have those three in place, then you can say with certainty, I have correct reasoning. If you don't have all three in place, then the reasoning is not correct. So Gesser was saying, I think if we try to explain this, we, uh, it, we will get confused. So maybe we will not explain this in detail, but just to know for a reason to be correct, we must have three things in place. The subject, the provision, which is forward provision, and the reverse uh, or the counter provision. Mm. So obviously there are different types of inference, but before we go into the different types of inference, uh, we have already talked, you know, given the main characteristics of inference, but let's look at the definition. And when you hear the definition, you will understand a bit more from that. So the definition or the whole chapter on inference begins on page 75 of the book. 
So we have here inferential cognizers. The definition of an inferential cognizer is a determinative knower which, depending on its basis, a correct sign, is incontrovertible with regard to its object of comprehension, a hidden phenomenon. There are two things that stand out in this definition. The first one is the basis. What is its basis? Its basis is a correct reason, correct sign, okay? And the other thing is the what is its object of comprehension? So as we say, it is making an assessment, it realizes something, therefore it must have an object of comprehension. And that object of com comprehension must be a hidden phenomenon. Okay, now other than that, um, we're dealing with a knower. So, you know, we have parts of this indicating, you know, that it's uh, this type of awareness. It's a knower that has to depend on this basis, has to have this particular type of um, comprehension, object of comprehension. Okay, so you might read the definition and you think this is very difficult, I'll never understand it, but if you break it into pieces, you will see how it gives you the story. It explains everything that happens here. So first of all, it says uh, we have a basis, isn't it? So we have something that acts as the basis, as the support. And what is this? This is the reason, the sign, the correct reason and the correct sign. So if you have the basis or the support, it means someone relies upon it. So who relies upon it? It's the inference that relies upon it. And by relying upon this correct reasoning, what does the inference do? The inference realizes its object of comprehension. And what sort of object is this? It's not an object that we can directly see, directly perceive. It is a hidden object. A hidden object is an object that you can only understand by relying on reasoning. It's not something that you can see directly. Okay, so... We, if we say that the reason is the basis and that type of awareness is generated by relying upon it, it means that the reason that is the basis is the cause of this type of awareness. Okay. So um, other parts of the definition tell us that it is incontroversible with regard to its object of comprehension. So incontroversible here, it means it is not deceiving, it is not wrong, it means it has made a very accurate assessment. So it relies upon the correct reason and correctly assesses that object, which is a hidden object. So it is incontroversible. There, it's like spot on, incontroversible means spot on, correct. Okay, the other part in the definition is determinative knower. So determinative knower, in a sense, is the opposite of the self-knower. Okay, we have the self-knower, okay, and then we have the determinative knower, the determinative knower knows something else. So the de determinative knower is something that you do not have with direct perceivers. You only have it with uh, conceptual minds. And it is the thought or this assessment that says fire. Like in this example, like you see the smoke and then you say fire. So you determine something else not self-knowing, knowing something else, and that else is fire, and you say fire. Okay, so all of this, I think it unpacks the definition. It explains what it is, isn't it? Okay, so we, as we said, we have different types of um, inferential cognizers. And as you can see here, we it also talks about subsequent cognizers. In terms of inferential cognizers, it can be prime awareness or valid awareness or not valid awareness. And so it can be prime 
and it can be subsequent. Uh, we will explain those things later. Mm. If you go to page 77, you will find uh, the three types of inferential cognizers. It says when inferential cognizers are divided, uh, there are three. The first one is inference through belief. The second one is inference through renown. And the third one is inference by the power of the fact. So you see, we have uh, three types of inference. And uh, this is because we have uh, three different objects of comprehension. And we have three different types of reasonings that are the basis or the causes that give rise to these three types of inference. So once you actually understand that we have three different types of objects and we have three different types of reasoning, then you will understand that we have three types of inference. Otherwise, if you cannot understand this or if you cannot keep this in mind, you will be you know, in doubt, like, is this inference at all? And if it is inference, what type of inference is it? And where am I? What's happening? Okay, so keep those three things. There are two sets of three things. And keep them without mixing them. Okay, so first of all, let's begin by explaining the three different objects of comprehension. As we say, inference comprehends something. And we have different types of inference because we, ha we have different objects of comprehension. So first of all, let's look at the objects of comprehension. We have already mentioned that there are three, but we begin with this presentation by presenting two types of objects, those that are hidden and those that are manifest. And then we go within the hidden and we subdivide the hidden because there are some objects that are slightly hidden and there are other objects that are very hidden. So if you follow this enumeration, okay, you can say hidden and manifest or hidden and obvious, but the other way of enumerating is to say we have slightly hidden, we have very hidden, and then we have the obvious, the manifest. The obvious or the manifest objects are objects that we, ordinary beings, we can directly perceive. We do not need to rely on any reasoning, on any calculation. You know, we don't need to compute anything. It's like the object is obvious and we can see it right there in front of us. So it is an object uh, that is known. It's well, it's a well-known, easily well-known object. Okay. So once you understand that you have these three different types of objects, uh, we, you know, we have, uh, we can see how we will, you know, go into this classification of the different types of inference. Of course, uh, there will be quite a lot of discussion whether this object is slightly hidden or whether it is very hidden and so on and so forth. Okay, so actually the text begins by explaining from those three objects, it, it begins the explanation from the very hidden phenomena. But the very hidden phenomena actually are quite difficult. And Geshe was saying, I don't want to start from the most difficult. Uh, Geshe would like to start with the one that is easier for us to comprehend. And this is the manifest. The manifest is the most obvious to comprehend. So another way that we describe the manifest, the obvious, is that which is renowned through a name. Okay, so it is known by a name. This is the manifest. Okay, so what type of reasoning would you need in order to establish that manifest that is renowned by name? You need the reasoning of renown. And what sort of inference you would get? You would get inference through renown. So you see, we line them all up and you find the, the term renown um, running all along. Reasoning by renown, the object that is comprehended is renowned through a name, through a sound, 
and the inference is the inference of renown or through renown. Okay, so we say here that by relying on the basis, which is a reason of renown, we generate a type of inference that is inference of renown, and that inference of renown has a particular object of comprehension that is called uh, renowned through name. It's an object renowned through name. Okay, so first of all, Gesha says, I would like to explain what is its object of comprehension? What is this object that is renowned through sound or name? First of all. Mm. Okay, so let's explain uh, this term that we are using here for this uh, object of knowledge, which is uh, ren renown um, by name. Okay, renowned by name most accurately is renowned and arisen through a particular name. And what do we mean by this? We mean that, you know, we describe objects with a particular term, with a particular noun, isn't it? We talk about the vase, we talk about the pillar and so on and so forth. And in a particular, you know, whatever is your language, depending on, you know, the family you are, depending on the area you are, the country that you live in, and so forth. So whatever the equivalent in your language and um, let's say the vocabulary that you use, if I say to you, there is a vase, that's all you need to know, right? This establishes to you the vase. You understand the vase, isn't it? You don't need to compute. You don't need to rely on any heavy syllogism and um, do, you know, rely on some technical reasoning and so forth. All you need to know is if I say to you, and we speak the same language you, un you understand, like in this uh, area, we all speak the same language. If I say to you, the vase, there is the vase or there is the pillar, you understand that isn't it? Okay, so you can see there are many objects uh, that are renowned, that are known um, through uh, different names. And also to people, we give certain names. So if we go through the Tibetan names, you can have Tashi, you can have Duntrup, you can have Tsering, you can have, you know, different names, isn't it? And, you know, in your family, you have many different names, isn't it? So the person, this particular person is known by this name. So you can see there are many things that are known, renowned by this name, by the sound of this name, of this word. Okay, so um, in uh, we mentioned names, the names of people. So we mentioned some Tibetan names, and Tibetan names are um, quite um, symbolic. So, for example, the name Tsering means long life. Dontrup means the one who accomplishes their purpose, their aims. Um, uh, Tashi means um, all auspiciousness and so forth. Okay, so does it mean that if I call a person Tsering, that this person, which means literally means long life, okay? Does it mean that this person has long life? If I call someone Dondrup, does it mean that this person is going to be very successful in all their activities? If I call someone Tashi, does it mean that everything will be auspicious about this person? No, this is not the case. However, I can still give them those names and I can, I can refer to these people with these names and everyone in the family will understand and they will say, this is Tsering, this is Duntrup, this is Tashi, right? Okay, so what is happening here? All right, uh, why is it that I can call it this, right? I can call it this because it is an object of comprehension, an object that can be realized. Because it is an object that can be realized, you can then call it um, 
tashi or vase or a pillar or whatever. And on the basis of that, you will generate the inference by the power of renown. Okay, so if we take this sequence from the beginning, we go at the first because we said. So what is the reason? Since this is an object that can be realized, okay, so that's the reason you rely upon. Then when you call it or when you hear Tash, this is Tashi, this is Vaz, this is Pillar, and so forth, you generate the inference through that renown. Okay, so the uh, typical example that we find in the text is uh, the moon, pos it is suitable to call the moon possessor the moon, right? So in, especially in Asia, another name for the moon is the uh, rabbit, what did I say? I said the moon yes. possessor, the rabbit, the rabbit possessor, okay? So that's another name for the moon. If you say rabbit possessor, you know, you know, people understand moon. I was talking about the moon. Okay, so uh, why is this? Why can we call them? Why can we call the moon rabbit possessor? Because I can, by hearing this, I can generate this conception in my mind. All right, so when I hear a sound, does that allow me to generate a conception to understand something in my mind? Yes. Okay, then I can call it this. It doesn't mean that it has to be this. So Gesher was saying, they gave me the name Tsering, and Tsering means long life. Gesher says, I don't think it's true. I don't know if I have a long life. I mean, you know, we are humans, we are fragile. I might, you know, I might pass away tomorrow or next month. You know, there's no guarantee that I will have a long life. Can you call me tearing? Yes, you can call me tearing because by hearing the sound tearing, you have a conception of tearing arising in the mind. You comprehend tearing. So as long as you comprehend that, that's all right. You can call the person tearing and it doesn't have to be true that they have a long life. So here we're talking about uh, uh, being, um, you know, it's okay to call it this. You can give it this name. You're allowed to call it this. So, for example, you can call the vase, you can call it a pillar. The pillar, you can call it a tree, if you like. The prime minister of your country, you could call, it, call him or her a thief, for example, isn't it? You're allowed. You can say you can say why, because uh, it it uh, it generates a concept in your mind. You comprehend that object. You can call anything everything. Okay. Now the question is: Should we be doing it? Calling names, right? Calling people names like this. Well. Uh, you technically you are allowed to do it. However, in terms of the law of the country, maybe it's not a good idea to do it. But here we are talking about inference through renown. Okay, something. Uh, it's an object of comprehension. It it can arise in your mind if you call it this through renown. Something, some comprehension will arise in your mind. Okay. Okay, so Geshe says, I hope you can understand this, the first type of inference, inference through renown. Inference through renown tells you that you can call the vase a pillar. You can call the dog a donkey, right? Why can you say this? <laughs> it's a very tall dog. Yes, very big dog. Yes, uh, you can call it this because by using this sound, you have a comprehension of an object. You comprehend an object through renown, through that name. It is known in our place, in our family, we call the dog donkey, isn't it? 
Yeah. So Gisha was saying, don't get caught up here trying to really analyze, is this the correct name? What's the meaning behind the name and so forth? So Gisha was saying, for example, my name is Nawang Tsering. And as we say, Tsering here means long life. Gisha says, it doesn't have to mean that I, you know, like there's a prophecy that I will have a long life or that I must have a long life or anything like this. I became ordained, this Lama who gave me this name. I don't know, at this moment, the name Tsering came into his mind. He says, what am I going to call him? Let's call him Tsering. Or maybe Tsering was part of the name of this Lama and he wanted to pass part of his name uh, to Geshe-la, right? But Geshe-la says, it doesn't mean that from that point onwards, we have to keep examining, is this a proper name? Does he have a long life? Will he have a long life? Was that uh, was he was this a wish for him to have a long life? It, it, it's nothing like this. I be, now I am known by the name Tsering. Now Tsering. Everybody calls me Tsering. So it doesn't matter whether my life is long or short. My name is Tsering. So I am known as Tsering. Okay. So this is inference by through renown. Don't try to overanalyze it. There's no reasoning. It's just like everybody calls him Tsering. Okay, that's all I need to understand. Because I do one last one. Yeah, the, the ultimate thing is because this is an object of comprehension of the mind. End of the story. Okay, so let's look at this. We have uh, an object. What type of object? An object that is renowned through a particular name, okay, through the sound, through a noun, through a name, okay. Um, uh, on the how are we going to understand this object? We need to rely upon a particular type of reasoning. What sort of reasoning? The reason of renown. The reason of renown that says that this is an object of comprehension in your mind. So by relying on this particular type of reasoning, the reason of renown, what type of inference we will generate? We will generate the inference through the power of renown. So just keep all three together. The object renown, the reason, renown, the inference, inference by the power of renown. So everything lines up. So the example that Geshe gave here, I can call the wood, I can call it stone. All right. I'm allowed to say this. I can say this. Okay. Why? Because this is an object by hearing stone in this area. Everybody understands that I'm talking about the wood, okay? So it is the object of comprehension of the now or in the mind through renown. In this place, we call the wood, we call it stone. Okay, so Gisha says, I hope that uh, today you understood the first type of inference, inference through renown. So did you understand that? Mm. Okay, tell me something. Inference through renown, tell me. Everybody knows what is Peter. Um, yes. I, okay, I, I just guess. Huh? Okay. Um, Peter is, everybody knows is Peter, but he also has another name called Mock, M-O-P. So when we say Mock, everybody understand that it is Peter. Okay, so, okay, so his uh, real name is Peter. However, you can call him Mock. You can apply the name Mock to him. You can re refer to him as Mock. And why is this? Because Mock is a name or a word that is an object that can arise in your mind, right? It's an object of conception. You could call him anything that comes to your mind. <laughs> okay, so 
really what's happening here is that at some point something makes you think i can give this name i can call it that isn't it and when you generate this mind that says i can call it that we are going to call it that by that name at this point you generate the inference through the power of renown okay so we say in order to have inference through the power of renown we must have different things first of all something must come prior to that and that is the reason and we say the reason is simply because uh, it came to your mind this is that's an object of conception into your mind you conceive this in your mind okay so that is the reason and on the basis of this you generate the inference through renown that says i'm going to call it that whatever came into my mind all right and that means that this allows you then to comprehend this object that is now renowned is known it is famed through this sound this particular name that you have allocated if you have all these three you have inference through renown okay so when we say here through renown it doesn't mean that it has to be renowned in the whole country in the whole universe like everywhere everyone would recognize this okay so you know whatever in our village or in our house we have a dog and we decide we're going to call the dog um a donkey why because it has big ears whatever it's a, this is what came to my mind I, I will call it donkey and from now on every time we say donkey we actually refer to the dog do people outside the family understand that we are talking about the dog no does everybody in the country understand this no does everyone in the universe understand this no the same thing with peter peter is also known as mock does everybody in the world know this is peter famous all over the world and <laughs> everyone knows that peter is is referred to as mock and every time you say mock it refers to this peter no mm. okay so I think we're talking about inference through renown so inference through renown obviously obviously it's a particular type of mind okay so trying to understand this you know how do i generate this particular type of mind this particular type of mind must have a specific object of comprehension so it has a, spe a specific type of object of comprehension isn't it so if it has this if i'm dealing with this type of object uh i how am i going to generate this type of mind all right you need a particular mind to comprehend a particular object through a particular avenue if you want you know through relying on a particular type of reasoning okay so Gesha says I hope you understand this it's a mechanism and through this you will understand inference through renown <laughs> okay so today from the three different types of uh, inference we covered perhaps the easiest one the inference through renown the other two are a little bit more involved through the power of the fact and uh, through belief so next week definitely we will cover these two objects and again you know we will summarize this hopefully we can um, cover all the other outlines a bit quicker so I guess I says I it is it is my hope and uh, more or less I'm guessing that you understood the inference through renown <laughs>